back. Uh, hope you're enjoying everything so far. We're going to move on to our next session, which is the APSA PDC, and I will let them explain what that is. Uh, and with us, we have four presenters. You only see three, but you're about to see four. Uh, we have Craig Lillehei, uh, we have Paul Yejorchek, and we have Chuck Snyder, and we have Dr. Mary Edwards, who's coming in virtually. So, Craig, take it away. Thank you, Todd. Uh, one of our challenges at the PDC each year is to identify those knowledge or practice gaps that our specialty may have. Uh, I must say, it's difficult to, to narrow those down, and in order to do that, you really need input from, from all of the absent communities. But what you're going to see here today is a slice of some of those 10, 10 topics that we thought, uh, as pediatric surgeons, we need to address. Clicker here. Oh, clicker. Do you have it? My name is Craig Alive from Boston Children's Hospital. I've got two of the topics that I'm, I'm going to represent today. And the first uh, is, is uh, implicit or explicit bias. If anything, these last few years, we've all struggled uh, and been challenged to try to understand our own explicit and implicit biases. I actually grew up in Minnesota, so George Floyd uh, hit home uh, to, to what I thought was a, a very liberal community. Absolute leadership has, has challenged us as an, as an institution, but specifically as pediatric surgeons to address some of these shortcomings. So let me uh, jump to the first question. So here it is. Pediatric Isn't surgical that intern leads her team to a oh. patient room on rounds. She identifies as black and is the only person of color on the team. She begins to introduce herself, but is interrupted by a white parent who says, finally, someone has come to take away the meal tray. The white pediatric surgery attending looks uncomfortable, opens his mouth as if to say something, and then closes it again. As a pediatric surgeon with a duty of compassionate care to patients and a mentor committed to diversity, inclusion, and protection of trainees, the pediatric surgeon should. The answers are before you. What do we do in that circumstance? Say nothing to avoid damaging the therapeutic relationship with the parent? Say nothing in the moment, but speak to the intern later to stress that what the parent said was wrong. Speak up, correcting the parent's mistake and encouraging to avoid role assumptions. Or D, speak up using humor to diffuse the uncomfortable situation. What would you do? Comments, the polls? I'd like to, I'd like to hear that. And yet in the same breath, I wonder how often we're we're exposed to that, and we come up with any number of excuses. Well, it's a very stressful situation. Or I don't want to undermine that relationship with the, with the parent. Or I'll talk to them later and, and sort of set this right. Well, speak up and uh, use the opportunity to correct the patient's mistake. Here, what we said to describe in our... Uh, discussion of this is that surgical inter intern has been uh, victimized by racialized stereotype that could be characterized as microaggression. Now, microaggression, verbal, nonverbal, environmental slights, snubs, invalidations, or insults that send hostile, derogatory, or negative messages to individuals based solely on their marginalized group membership. Now, next paragraph I think is particularly important. Micro, it's anything but micro. Uh, this, these sort of, they're referred to as, as small, repeatedly, that the individuals are repeatedly experiencing them, but they have a cumulative impact, uh, isolation, uh, self-doubt. Uh, that's the kind of, of behavior that we've got to uh, turn around. And by not speaking up, the, the bystander is compounding that harm, even if later on you come. So what's the personal practice change? Well, what we're asking is that uh, uh, for us to be upstanders, bystanders who respond with action to these microaggressive behaviors. That's the only way we're going to change it uh, professionally, for our hospitals, for our institutions, for our patients. 
I'm delighted to, that uh, in the audience, uh, Mira Kodigal, uh, one of the references that we alluded to was, was uh, Mira's report. It was for pediatrics, I believe, their ethics rounds, but it really honed in on, on uh, what a problem microaggression is. You know, I think that we talk about uh, explicit bias, we talk about implicit bias, and then we hone it down and say, oh boy, these microaggressions are happening. Mira, comments? uncomfortable in those moments about being an upstander is exactly what you're talking about. How do I not alienate the family, right? How do I not create differences or make, and particularly thinking about this, that intern and how you not avoid making that intern uncomfortable too. And I think one of the biggest things to think about in those moments is intent versus impact. So very often families, what they're doing, those, those implicit biases are not intentional, right? They, they don't necessarily recognize that that's what they're doing in that moment. And if we separate intent from impact, it's easier to respond to understanding the impact and talking about what the impact is and not worrying so much about what the intent is. Because the intent is sort of irrelevant. The impact already exists. And so I think that helps alleviate us from that anxiety about how the family, you approach it as like, hey, you maybe didn't intend this, but let me, let me help you understand how that impacted the person who was standing there. Well, thank you, Mira, and I hope that uh, uh, that insight uh, about intent will uh, get rid of all those excuses that sort of come to mind uh, in my own. Uh, I'm going to make a comment. Please. You can take the mic, hold it right up to your mouth, because I don't want to touch your mouth. All right. All right, let's move on to the next question. Here, you're seeing a mother carrying a fetus diagnosed with left-sided CDH, congenital diaphragmatic hernia. You knew we were going to get to that topic. The ODE uh, observed the expected rate LHR using the tracing method at 24 weeks is 28%. Follow-up measurement at 26 weeks is 32%. The parents conceived this baby after significant difficulty and are asking about the outcomes of fetal tracheal occlusion or fetal therapy for their baby. I get a lot of that. <laughs> okay, but he refresh. Great resources. I must say, I was a little worried when Jose was going through the articles. I thought he was going to going to pull mine. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, okay, let's come to the poll. There's a. Do we have the results of the poll? Okay. Now I heard in in the uh, background here that there are two right answers. Give me the give me the uh, two right answers. Embellish on that, Rick? Well, I mean, you could argue that some folks might opt, opt for B. I would go for D. But there are people that I think they would opt for B. I, I would agree with that. I think that FIDO, there is data to suggest that FIDO is an effective procedure in very select population of patients. Thank you. I, I think that's sort of where we are, are right now. Now, this, this slide, I've tried to put all the results of the total trial, 2021 lead articles in the New England Journal of Medicine, the first and second article. The first was severe CDH. The second article was moderate CDH. And interesting, they, they came to somewhat different conclusions. In the severe group, okay, uh, that uh, FIDO was in, in fact improved, significantly improved survival. In the moderate group, moderate CDH, what happened was, yes, there was some improvement in survival, but it wasn't, didn't approach significance. So that's, that's where some of the debate uh, comes. Now, some of those online might be, might be able to have read that slide, but uh, thanks to the um, uh, Educations Committee, uh, practicing surgeon subcommittee, I've got a visual abstract that I stole from them to really describe things for you, but uh, tells us a little about the FIDO trial, the total trial, and, uh, and in the moderate group, their conclusion was that FIDO was not yet beneficial, and in the severe CDH it was. 
I will tell you that there was some editorial response uh, from uh, none other than uh, Charlie Stoller and some others uh, commenting that please understand that this was in the setting well, there's a few problems with this. Number one, it was a study that was done over a, an 11-year period where, where these patients were accumulated. Number two, it was at a lot of different centers. Some, you know, there was a protocol for how you manage a CDH, but it varied considerably from, from place to place, undoubtedly. And, and lastly, if you're going to apply this, maybe these were very experienced fetal centers. So I think the answer for us as pediatric surgeons right now is FIDO is certainly an emergent therapy which is very appealing, particularly in, in our most severe CDH, but it's got some problems. Prematurity is a big one. Premature rupture of membranes. What's the price of that uh, that these kids uh, pay for later on down the line? And, and that's still something that needs to be worked out. Comments, please. you have to really know your own center's numbers, especially for the moderate. Like for the severe, it's impressive. And for those of us who have seen babies who've had a fetal, it's it's a different scenario. Even when they're born prematurely, they often don't go on ECMO, which is just, it's crazy. But for the moderate, I think you have to know your numbers. And if your center's survival is better than you know what they're producing in this trial, then maybe you don't need to do fetal for those moderate babies. I think it's just, it's highly variable. You know, I think it's a theme that we've been hearing a lot already today is that keep your eyes wide open. It often isn't uh, just a binary, I think was, was your word, Sean, uh, a binary answer to some of these questions. Okay, with that, I've, uh, let's move on, cognizant of the time. Our next speaker is actually going to come to you virtually, uh, Mary Edwards. And uh, Mary, I think you're going to magically appear and I'll, I'll show your slides. Can everyone hear me? Hello? Can anyone hear me? Yes. We can hear you. Okay, hi everyone. Well, or hello from upstate New York. I'm so sorry I can't be there in person. Um, can everyone see my slides? Okay, so just... Um, just FYI, I'm having a really hard time hearing the discussion in the room, Todd, but I can hear you perfectly. So if someone uh, has a question or wants to stop, just use yeah, on me and I'll... We're, we're working on that. Okay. All right. So um, what I'm going to talk about briefly is uh, intraoperative radiation safety and pre-op fasting. So we will jump right in with the first question. And so you are called at midnight from a community hospital uh, with a level two NICU regarding your patient who is a 28 week preemie who is scheduled for a hernia repair at seven in the morning. He's otherwise well, and he's actually ready to go home. But the NICU has attempted to get an IV in him 10 times without success, and they've had it, and the kid has had it, and they call you and they wanna know what you want to do. So do you tell them, put an IO line in and give them maintenance fluids and make them NPO? Do you just tell them to allow them to continue to feed and just postpone the procedure, send them home, I'll deal with it in the office later on? Or do you allow feeds of Pedialyte until five or six in the morning and just tell them to stop with the IV attempts? Or do you, do you transfer them to another hospital? So I for the poll to come up. Any comments? No one? Mark? Mark Wilcon. You might, you might say you should transfer that patient. <laughs> but, uh, you know, again, I think the, the evidence, I know our anesthesiologists allow Pedialyte up to even an, an hour or two hours before the procedure. So there's no reason you can't continue with oral hydration with a baby like this prior to surgery. All right, what do the polls say, Owen? Most people are saying C, to allow feeds until 5 or 6 a.m. and then stop the IV attempts. Okay, Mary. Gosh, smart group. So yes, that is the correct answer. 
So, you know, this subject is, uh, it's evolving. Um, and if I'm right, Todd, we have a huge international audience here today, right? Correct. Mostly international. So it, yep. is, so it is amazing to me how variable practices are around the world. Um, but I can briefly say, you know, NPO guidelines for children are in general based on very poor evidence. And if you do even a Google search, you'll find that from institution to institution, they vary a lot. The problem is, is that pulmonary aspiration is very scary, but it's also very rare. And it usually happens in emergency surgeries in children that are at high risk for aspiration. It just is very rare in elective procedures. So, and the other thing is studies suggest that clear liquids containing carbohydrates empty the stomach very quickly, and that really doesn't vary based on age. One of the more recent consensus statements came out of Britain and Ireland, and uh, in their consensus statement, they essentially recommend one hour of NPO to clear liquids, uh, four hours for breast milk, um, and six hours for solid foods in children under uh, 17. In the United States, actually, the ASA, the American Society of Anesthesiologists, is updating their, um, their policy or their consensus statement on NPO guidelines. And it is open for public comment, if any of you want to comment. But currently, what they recommend is two hours for clear liquids, four hours for breast milk, six hours for non-human milk and light meals, and eight hours for a heavy meal. The European Society of Anesthesia and Intensive Care actually is much more liberal. And what they recommend is one hour for clear liquids, three hours for breast milk, four hours for formula, and six hours for everything else. And our Australian and New Zealand colleagues, if they're on the line, they concur with those recommendations. Um, the Pediatric Anesthesia Societies in Britain, Ireland, and Canada go along with the ASA guidelines, except they essentially say one hour for clear liquids. So things are moving in uh, the direction of being more liberal, but I can tell you one thing about all these consensus statements is that there's now language in there that essentially says, you need to make every effort not to keep these children NPO for long periods of time prior to surgery. It's bad, it generates ketone bodies, causes hypoglycemia, it makes them just very irritable in the pre-op um, sort of area. Any questions or discussion on that? Comments on that. It's interesting, I mean, it's kind of uh, uh, aggravating that everyone does it different because it's confusing, but on the other hand, now maybe we can look at the differences and, uh, and study that and see who, do who does it better. All right, let's keep going. Okay, we can probably move right along here. Um, okay, so now you're in the operating room. You're putting in a metaport in a one-year-old for chemotherapy. You get the port in, everything goes well. You take out the introducer sheath though, and the tip of the catheter is in the cardiac silhouette and you just are having a really hard time seeing exactly where it is. So you've got the C arm there. And the question is to aid visualization while minimizing radiation to the patient and the staff in the room, you should A, utilize the magnification setting on the C arm, B, utilize continuous fluoroscopy to determine the position of the tip. C, reposition the patient closer to the x-ray source, or D, collimate the beam. inject dye. There's a national shortage of ice of you. You can't use it. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually a true statement, but. Okay. But it was funny anyways. Okay. Let's see the uh, poll results. What is it, Ellen? M majority are saying D, collimate the beam. All right. 
And that would be correct. So minimizing exposure of children to ionizing radiation should be standard, but you have to get an adequate image. Um, you wanna minimize exposure not only to the patients, but also to yourself and the OR team. So utilizing as low as reasonably achievable or a LARA best practice guidelines for fluoroscopy, which at least in the United States is not routinely taught to, taught to surgeons, includes positioning the patient as close as possible to the image intensifier or the flat plate detector, which usually means in the standard configuration, configuration of the C-arm, raising the bed as far as possible close to that II. You obviously wanna shield appropriately. You want to use pulse mode as opposed to continuous, which is actually very feasible in most of the applications in pediatric surgery, including the one described in this scenario. You just don't need the temporal resolution of continuous fluoroscopy. Pulse should be fine. Collimation is key. Uh, and you want to avoid use of mag at, if at all possible. When every time you hit the mag setting on the fluoro machine, it significantly increases the radiation dose, not only to the patient, but also to the room. What collimation does is it focuses the x-ray beam to a specific area. And because you're getting more radiation to that specific area, it tends to increase the detail and the clarity of the image but because it limits the field, it decreases the total dose of the patient because the surface area getting irradiated is smaller. Um, and it also decreases the dose to the room. So just uh, by way of, I guess, demonstrating this. So these are two esophagrams that I did. And hopefully you can appreciate that the one where collimation was used, it's just much more clear. You can kind of see the mucosal detail of the esophagus better. Um, and this is really entirely a function of collimation. It's very easy to do in modern machines. The tech can sort of, you know, give you a little preview of what you'll see with collimation. I will say that you have to be careful when you collimate on a very small patient because you can overexpose the image. So you don't want to get too carried away with it. But in general, collimation will allow you to see more detail with less radiation. Uh, overview room, a uh, view of the room for one second, or is that going to complicate things? A wide shot of the room. So I want to ask, raise your hands if you knew all this. Raise your hand. You can be honest. It's not arrogant. Cocky. Okay, fine. <laughs> all right. So uh, it looks like half the room. For, for me, there were two modes of fluoroscopy, on or off. Uh, I, I didn't know the, all these other things. So <clears throat> Mary, do we just tell, uh, or if we're doing it ourselves, do we tell the the technician, can you help me collimate? Is that, is that I mean, how do you, Chuck, you do it? So, yeah. so I've, I've, I only know my own experience. I've done, you know, I've worked in like three different hospital systems in my career, but I just tell the tech, collimate down on the mediastinum and they have a little preview button. Yep. And so whatever the last image is up there, they'll sort of, they have a little frame that'll kind of zoom down and you know that's where they're gonna focus on. And then you get another image there. But you just tell the tech to do it. Um, and they can collimate down in a uniform circle. They can collimate down in a stripe, like is what, which is what they did here. But you just tell them to do it. And it's the same with pulse mode. I just tell them, go to pulse mode, four frames a second, two frames a second. And they know how to do it. They know way more about fluoroscopy than we do, obviously. But, um, but yeah, it's really uh, pretty simple. Oh, I'm just curious. Um, the people here from Kansas City know we have a person named Nuclear Nancy. I don't really know what her full name is. But <laughs> she makes us take a little quiz every year on radiation safety. And I wonder how many people have to do that to be able to use fluoroscopy at their institution. Raise your hand. Who does that? Uh, I do it. Okay. Yeah. So, so, Todd, yeah. Why don't you use if you're having trouble visualizing the image. I mean, shouldn't that be... Isn't that their area of expertise? Uh, Good question. Right. I, well, but it, it, it should be... Maybe that's what we work on, is having better uh, communication and proactive uh, suggestions by uh, the technicians. Yeah, Jose. I mean, like the esophagogram you showed was 
was it done in a, with a C arm or was it done in a full fluoroscopy suit? Because um, I've seen collimation in the big room with with everything, but I'm not sure about being able to use collimation in, with the C arm. They're saying that everyone's nodding their head. You can. So okay. You can. Okay. Um, all right, uh, Mary. I don't know if you were able to hear that or not, but uh, uh, um, okay. Uh, I think we'll move on. I just the summary points there were columnate, pulse, shield, and there was one more I forgot, but uh, it's... Columnate, shield, no mag, pulse, no mag. avoid bag, and okay. position the patient close to the II. Got it. Okay. Perfect. We'll hopefully come back next year and find we've all had, we need almost like a timeout for that to make sure. All right. Next patient. <laughs> okay. So the next question is kind of similar. So a nine-year-old girl is undergoing an elective colloidal cyst resection, and you plan to start with an intraoperative cholangiogram. In order to obtain the best image with the least radiation exposure to the patient and the room, you plan to do all of the following except, I'm sorry, Craig, I know I'm not supposed to write questions this way, but I just, I, I had to. Um, so all of the following except, um, a, position the patient as close as possible to the image intensifier during fluoroscopy. B, utilize the pulse mode during fluoroscopy. C, drape lead aprons over the patient's pelvis and neck. D, collimate the beam in the right upper quadrant. All right, thoughts on this? Who's got the microphone? All right. Miguel, Witt, or Jose, since you have the microphone, pick A, B, C, or D. You guys don't know, so now you're on the spot. Your hearts are racing because I just called on you. <laughs> I, I picked Jose. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Alan, what did the polls show? Aprons over the pelvis and neck. I would, I would. You can't take credit for his answer. <laughs> okay. All right. Microphone. All right. Mary, uh, Alan, what did the polls say? All right, Mary, what's the answer? What did the poll say? Can I know or no? Oh, oh, she didn't. Sorry. We, we keep forgetting about microphones. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's pretty close between draping. Actually, more people are saying colony now. It keeps changing, but currently 47% are saying colony. Okay, this is the reason why I got into this is because, um, and I know this is probably TMI, but I used to be involved in general surgery education and I went into a room and I saw one of my former residents actually putting a drape over a patient who was pregnant during a IOC. So you need to appreciate that by convention, the x-ray source in the C-arm is placed below the table. It's below the table. And it doesn't have to be that way, but the tech is always gonna put it that way because the patient and the table protect you and everyone else in the room from the radiation. But if you put a drape on top of a patient, you're doing absolutely nothing to protect them wow. from radiation because it's coming That's from awesome. below the table. Now, the other thing you need to understand is the way these machines work is they utilize this thing called automatic brightness control. So if there's something in the field that is preventing that beam from, from reaching the image intensifier and giving you an image, the computer will automatically tell the x-ray source to increase the energy. So if that shield is in the field, you're actually increasing exposure to the patient. So if you're gonna shield, if it's a conventional sort of way the C-arm is set up with the II above and the source below, you need to put those drapes below the patient. And the problem is, you know, the techs know this, but the techs don't come in the room until all the drapes are on and they don't know where the shields are. So it is a commonly made mistake and it's a bad mistake. So everything in that, in the, that I said, all those choices were correct, except the draping and it has to do, or excuse me, the shielding, and it has to do with where the shield is placed. You want it to all go right. beneath the patient. All right, who knew that? Raise your hand if you knew. Gosh, this is the smarter side. <laughs> okay, let's keep going. <laughs> All right, that's, yeah. So my, my question to you and Mary is if you put the shielding below the patient, does that mean you keep the shielding there throughout the 
case and the patient's lying on the shielding? And does that cause problems with sores and, and pressure issues and whatnot? Or So you can put the shielding underneath, you know, the gel pad or whatever it is that you have. But, you know, the other thing you need to remember is a good uh, collimation is your friend here, too. You know, the, the collimator is a lead plate that's sort of, and I, you probably can't see my pointer, it's on top of the tube. And so the collimation actually will help shield as well. Um, but yeah, to answer your question, I think it was wit. You can put your your x-ray shield below your gel pad and it will still work. Well, I must tell you, I don't think I've ever seen that done in, in my career. So I think this is important and interesting information. Mary, so what, I, what I'm hearing you say is that not, not that we should be shielding underneath the patient, but that we should be doing all those other things that you were talking about. Because I, I think shielding underneath the patient is probably problematic for a lot of reasons, including the increased potential for increased exposure if you're not getting the uh, right image to the, uh, to the beam. I hear an opportunity for innovation So I'll be here. honest with you. The only time I, I collimate a lot, this is just my practice. I'm not saying this is the gospel truth. I collimate a lot, but the only time I really make it a point to shield is if the patient's pregnant. Um, you know, uh, again, that's just my practice. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, Mary. Let's go to the next case. Oh, that's it. Mary, you're done. Uh, I think. Awesome. Yeah, that's. This is one of those things that I, Mac loves. I, I knew nothing about. I, uh, I, I, again, I was on or off. So this was huge for me, and I actually paid attention, which is even a bigger plus. That was really good. All right. So let's see. I can not trip over the cord. What's what else am I supposed to do? Um, how do I get my slides up? Just advance this. Okay. There we go. Okay, I have uh, three topics, and the first one is straight from Dr. Ponsky himself, CT evaluation of suspected airway foreign body. So here's the question. A nine-year-old child presents after choking episode at home associated with transient rep respiratory distress. She has a prior history of asthma. In the emergency department, she appears in no distress with an expiratory wheeze on exam Chest x-ray is normal. The parents are concerned about the risk of negative bronchoscopy given her history of asthma. So the most appropriate management, and all of mine I think are somewhat controversial answers. Uh, MRI of the chest, CT scan of the chest, uh, C, admit and observe, or D, contrast enhanced ultrasound. The operating room. Yes. And maybe, that got, maybe that got cut off. Was that, that was one of the, so, um, okay, I don't know how anyone, can, you can type in your answer if you would go straight for Bronk. Well, I know the answer from 20 years ago. I know, well, okay, but also this was presented in a previous one from that rate from the radiologist, so it's interesting that this is back on the agenda again. Any, uh, all right, what's, what does the poll say, Ellen? Oh, they haven't done it yet. All right, why don't we uh, just go straight. It will go straight. It looks like the poll came up. M most are saying CT, but you introduced it as the topic of CT for, for airway foreign bodies, so they cheated. Okay. All right. Let's let's go to the next slide. Okay. So the answer yes is CT scan, uh, and this just highlights a report in the Journal of Pediatric Surgery that Dr. Ponsky was the author on. Uh, it's just a, a issue of uh, using a CT scan in patients who you otherwise would have a low threshold of suspicion in. And in their report, uh, they divide the patients into a couple of groups. One went straight to bronchoscopy, the other got CT scan. If the CT scan was negative, then they got sent home. And if the CT scan uh, was positive, they went to the operating room. And 94% of the time, they actually found a foreign body. And then uh, there have been a couple of other reports of this. Uh, and there are just uh, different suggestions for when that might be useful. One obviously being the patient you have a low threshold of suspicion in. Uh, another example is an institution where there's no ENT or pediatric surgery 
uh, expertise available and they have a child with that, they could sometimes uh, avoid intervention or avoid transferring them to some other institution in that circumstance. Uh, at least as far as I know at our institution, we haven't done this very often. We've shifted over time to where the ENT service now manages the airway form bodies far more than we do, although we used to do it quite a bit. Um, so I don't know what other institutions experience with this is or how many people utilize this. It'd be interesting to pull the... Yeah. Well, I, just one comment. The reason that we switched to this um, is that there are, if it's clearly an airway aspiration, you go to the operating room. It's the ones you don't know. And what we found is the ones you don't know, it's a suspicious story. They were coughing after eating. More often than not, it's reactive airway and it's not a foreign body. So you're instrumenting the airway of kids that already have a reactive airway. It made no sense. We were having a lot of negative bronx because we were so worried. CAT scan, pretty much almost 100% will direct you to go to the OR or not. So it's very low radiation and it eliminates those that are equivocal of getting an unnecessary instrumentation of their airway in the face of reactive airway disease. Um, any concerns, comments, or questions from the audience? Whit? Yes, sir. Um, what are the reasons for the false negatives on the CT scans? And so, so, so we can alert folks who are using that technology. So I, I have to ask, I don't remember, the, the number of false negatives was either zero or close to zero. I don't remember. It was, it was zero. It was zero. There were no false there negatives. There was telephone follow-up, and the follow-up was incomplete, so there's... Unknowns, maybe. Yeah. But there were no... Right, so the only way to know if it's a false negative is, did something happen to them afterwards? You would never know, right? And of all the patients that were called, there were there was not any scenarios where anyone had any... So there's no way to ever know, right? But the false, po false positives are were very unusual, like 6% or something like that. So 94% were completely accurate. And that was like mucus or something like that. You'd go in and it was a false positive, but it's incredibly surprisingly accurate and they do not need to be radio opaque. It can be plastic, it can be anything. So, all right. Comments, questions, or should we move on to the next? All right, next. This was a suspected foreign body aspiration common scenario. We went through all this already. I don't think I need to read it again. Uh, just a less invasive alternative to the traditional binary decision of operator, observe. Okay, uh, so the next one, uh, a six-month-old boy had a chest x-ray uh, due to chronic cough and right lower lobe uh, cystic lung mass was seen. Subsequent chest CT scan demonstrated a macrocystic four centimeter lesion in the right lower lobe with a question of a feeding vessel. Mother had serial prenatal ultrasounds for placental position and no lesion was ever seen. Which factor is most concerning for possible malignancy in this child? Um, and the choices are the size of the lesion, the location of the lesion, the absence uh, of the lesion on prenatal ultrasound, or presence of a systemic feeding vessel. The most concerning factor for possible malignancy. Most people on the polls are saying C, the absence of the lesion on prenatal ultrasound. Wait, if you have comments, talk on the mic. Raise your hand if you have a comment. Okay. So this is just based on uh, a recent Midwest Pediatric Surgery Consortium paper from 2021 that Dr. Kumasaki was the, the lead author on and several of the other authors here uh, where they reviewed uh, 521 primary lung lesions from 11 different children's hospitals and tried to identify factors that were associated with uh, uh, malignancy in those patients. And so in that series, um, none of the, none of the um, overall, I guess, none of the uh, prenatally diagnosed lesions were malignant. 10% of them that were diagnosed postnatally were malignant, roughly 10%, I think it was more around eight and a half or so. And then about half of the malignant lesions were associated with a DICER-1 mutation. Uh, there was no malignant lesion that had a systemic feeding vessel. And then the, the other factor that was notable was that the CT scan wasn't terribly useful. And there was a subsequent follow-up paper published later just looking at the CT scan accuracy and diagnosing PPB, and it was not very good. They used the same data. They had nine different radiologists look at the lesions uh, and the inter- rate or reliability between the various radiologists was pretty poor. Um, 
and then overall the sensitivity and specificity of the CT scan, even at picking up malignancy, was was pretty poor as well. In this paper, they mentioned that um, increased uh, suspicion of malignancy by CT and bilateral disease were predictors, but as I said, they looked at the CT issue a little bit more thoroughly later on with another uh, publication. Um, our patients who've had a prenatal diagnosis, uh, prenatal diagnosis of a lesion, and does that, the fact that we've seen it on, uh, does that reassure you that it's not malignant? That was sort of the implication that none of these uh, were, that it was not seen on prenatal ultrasound, uh, they were all, that was, a, I'm not the world expert, this, but certainly I think overall the studies that have looked at PPDs, there are some that are present on prenatal ultrasound, it's a, fra a small fraction of five to 10%. Uh, so I don't think you could definitively say, uh, no, it was only seen postnatally, it wasn't there prenatally, so there's a 100% guarantee that it's not. Thank you, and that's that's actually what, what uh, Sean had said after his talk, I came up to him and said, you gotta be, be careful about this message. We'll see. Yeah, podcast series, we looked at the same article. Actually, this series has like, I think 400 cystic lesions and um, there was not a single patient who had antenatal diagnosis who was found to have a PPB. There's another Canadian series, so if you sum it up, it's like 600 patients. If you have prenatal diagnosis, the chances of be, if, if it being PPB, it's close to zero. Actually, there's, a, there's like four or five case reports with PPB with antenatal lesions misdiagnosis, CPAM. So it's extremely, extremely rare. Instead of calling it, is this wrong, Chuck or Craig or whoever, is this wrong to say this statement? Yes, it's prenatal versus postnatal, and we're seeing those as the two groups. Prenatal don't have cancer, postnatal can. Is another way of saying it is symptomatic and asymptomatic, that if they're presenting postnatally, it's because they're symptomatic. So the symptomatic patients have a risk of cancer, the asymptomatic patients are very low. And my second half of the question is, and I'm curious what Wolken and Sean and everyone else here says, is Jack Langer right? Uh, should we not be taking these things out now? If, so. if I recall correctly, 50 some percent of the PPBs were asymptomatic. So one sort of old thing, well, they'll be okay. symptomatic, but they, they, there was a large percent that were not. So you say some of the uh, prenatal ones are not symptomatic? What I'm saying, so the question from Rick Pearl was, am I saying that some of the prenatal ones are not, are all of them not symptomatic? And the answer is two separate things. I'm saying that prenatal as a prenatal diagnosis is before you know if they're symptomatic or not. They're prenatal. So some would say, and now I take them all out, uh, but some would argue, some would argue that, look, if you diagnose these prenatally and they don't ever get symptoms, you don't have to take these out. I think that's the argument because the numbers are so low. And, and I, we've had this debate on, on these events so many times, and this is the first time my needle went from always take them out, I'm like, maybe, maybe there's some validity to what they're saying, although we're not talking about infection. We've never gotten to that part, but other comments? Yeah, Raise your hand. Yeah, Miguel. Right away, Mike, uh, so the question was what, Rick? Right, the question is timing of taking them out. I think if you decide to take it out, oh, because to see if they get symptomatic or not? Yep. No, 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 I don't be, don't, if, you're, if you're a resector, resect it early. But if you're not a resector, do what you want. But yeah, that's my- But PB, <laughs> P, <laughs> but PB could be near zero, but it's not zero. That's the thing. I mean, yeah, asymptomatic or not symptomatic, it's not zero. So at, at, at the end of the day, at some point, you have a patient with a malignant tumor undiagnosed that you're keeping the thing inside forever. Is there anyone in this room that leaves an asymptomatic prenatally diagnosed lesion? So it's, it's not zero, but Beth. I think you'd have to take 600 um, resections just to like treat one PPV. So numbers matter in this case. I, I'm talking about asymptomatic, so prenatally diagnosed, asymptomatic. because ultrasound technology is so good. And then these moms then get a fetal MRI, and then they get all these consultations, and then we see them, and they get a CT scan after birth. And a lot of these turn out to be nothing. Either it's not there, 
It's some sort of mucus plug that's gone away. So everything gets lumped into this garbage basket of CPAM in the fetal diagnosis world, you know, with a, a you know, hybrid lesion with a, you know, all these different like variations, but uh, I'll, some of them aren't anything. So I do think that the, the management's changing because we have to change with the technology and what we're finding. Six, six months old and have a CT that clearly show a malformation. That, that's what we're talking about. Mark? I worry less about cancer than, you know, I've had a few of these kids that have been referred to me when they're four, five, six, seven, eight, nine years old that have had recurrent pneumonias. And it's, I mean, all of us have probably been there. It is a mess. And the chances of them having a th successful thoracoscopic resection or, you know, at least in my hands are, are much lower in that age group than they are in the perinatal period or, or yeah. in that first year of life. So, I mean, I think my reason for taking them out is to prevent that. Yeah. Then uh, I'm less worried. You know, when I, when I counsel parents, even before, you know, I say that the risk of, can you know, they'll read about it and they'll, they come in all nervous about cancer, but it's, it's not the cancer. I worry about these recurrent pneumonias and real problems with yeah. bronchiectasis. I agree with that. Just one last thing, but remembering the, the range of anomalies. Sometimes you, you, these are trivial little cysts and, and probably uh, don't make much difference one way or the other. Other times, they are actually multi-lobar, and, and what it's going to mean if you're going to take them out is that you're going to do a pneumonectomy, and that doesn't seem sensible either. So I think uh, as pediatric surgeons, we're all, uh, we've are all we got to tailor ours to, to what that actual pathology is. I think it's opening our eyes that we don't know it yet. Every year we're learning a little more. We're tailoring, I think that's the best phrase. This probably doesn't solidify any new practice plan for anyone, but I think it's we're getting more information with each year. So it was a good discussion. Chuck? Uh, yeah, so, uh, summary here, primary reasons to resect the lesions are the possibility of infection and risk of malignancy. And the risk of malignancy may be a smaller reason actually for most people. Systemic feeding vessels and prenatal diagnosis in this study were the two factors that were associated with significant lower risk. So going to our next question, about six months ago, Craig and I FaceTimed Jose. He, I think, was at some sort of winery in Chile. And we said, is there any way in the interest of space learning that you can just present many of the same exact questions that we're going to present right before we do it? And he said, absolutely, no problem. I've got you guys covered. Um, so this one's about a 13-year-old girl who's been ill for six days. She undergoes a laparoscopic appendectomy for perforated appendicitis. Which of the following antibiotic choices was recently shown in 2021 to have a significantly lower post-operative abscess rate, ER visit, and rate of post-operative CT scans compared to ceftriaxone and metronidazole? I can go pretty quickly through this. The answer, Zosin, Piperacillin, and Tazobactam. And this just cites the impact study. Um, since it's already been discussed a little bit, there was a, a study that, that Sean alluded to by Sean Rangel uh, of 654 patients in a NISQIP study across multiple institutions that showed kind of opposite results of this, suggesting that ceftriaxone uh, and metronidazole were preferred over, uh, over uh, piperacillin and tazobactam. And so uh, I, I wouldn't say that this impact study was necessarily a clear cut study. It's multi-institutional, but 75% of the patients were at one institution, 25% were at another. So it's by institutional, I guess. Um, but uh, we, we have this issue with a lot of things in the PDC where uh, it's nice to make questions where there's absolutely a clear cut answer. On the other hand, if you do that, then you're probably not trying to keep people up to date very well by picking topics that are worth uh, discussion and worth knowing about. So this is one of those where, um, you know, there's a recent, well done, good randomized study suggesting one thing, but there are other studies that are also not bad studies suggesting another. So I think the jury's probably still out on this one. I don't know how much time we, we've already kind of covered yeah, it. I so I keep going, but there's already two people that have presented this data and then Sean arranged on our parade. Yeah, but yeah. we were. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's it. Wow. Oh, wow. All right, last, last set, um, Paul Yuzhochuk um, from uh, Peoria. So again, uh, six month old undergoing a colostomy closure um, after his uh, PSARP, following statements correct about mechanical bowel prep. 
uh, decreases leaks, decreases hospital stay, promotes early feeding, has no effect on SSI. Um, and I think what's fascinating in my career, I, I read a lot about this, different faculty, especially adult colorectal surgeons. If you read some of the early papers, it said things like a vigorous mechanical bowel preparation as if we're shaking or doing jumping jacks after the thing. Um, uh, so, so what do people think here while we're waiting for the polls? A, B, C, or D? No effect, effect, D, Miguel says D. Anyone disagree with Miguel? What is the audience say? Not up yet, all right. We'll Not up, but it, it, is, it is D, really no effect. There is some data that says it actually increases surgical site infections. The things that people are looking at in a lot of the studies, the issue is it doesn't look at just one thing. It adds things like oral antibiotics plus the mechanical bowel prep. Um, we know of the strong data, it's appropriate timing of our preoperative intravenous antibiotics. Um, really no strong data to support any of the other things um, and some smaller case series on the use of oral antibiotics, flagell, things like that, um, but really nothing strong to change too much on as far as that goes. Uh, so NEC again, um, Jose thankfully prepped everybody so we should do this well. Um, five day old, again, questions of PPD or laparotomy discussed with the family. This highlights a little bit of a different aspect. So the benefits of the laparotomy, um, A, mortality, B, stricture rate, C, neurodevelopmental outcome, D, postoperative intra-abdominal abscess. Um, I guess the question for me and maybe in the room is how small is too small to do a laparotomy? Right, the NEST trial and the papers from this, the cutoff was about a kilogram. Everybody feels sort of, uh, you know, safe with that. But how, how small have, have people done laparotomies in safely? 500 grams, 450. So. Anesthetic as well, not on the surgical part. I mean, you have, it's a joint effort, basically. Thoughts? Do you guys have uh, agreed upon standards in your practice? Because I know we had a case like this recently and there was a lot of debate. Um, no? Okay. Uh, so again, Herculean effort to, to get the, the trial done. It does show that uh, neurodevelopmental outcomes are improved compared to uh, peritoneal drainage. Um, and I think sometimes the challenge for me, so this, one of my patients clearly very sick, sort of clearly NEC. Sometimes there's that gray area where people argue, well, it's just a sip. A drain will do fine, you don't need to operate. Sometimes it's hard to say unless you're looking at the bowel that it's necrotizing enterocolitis in the first place. And you know, that's this uh, definitive, you know, as Dr. Perl had said in the previous session, drain is a definitive thing. Well, yeah, if there's just a little perforation, the child does great, you sort of quote unquote get away with it, maybe deal with the stricture down, down the side. Um, and so I, I uh, I'm glad, you know, we have, uh, you know, thankfully Dr. Blakely and the team have given us at least a little bit more data, um, which is still a challenging, you know, thing with, with decades of uh, information. Because you don't know exactly what is going on in intra-abdominally in terms of has he, the patient has an in, a per, pneumoperitoneum and that's it, you know, if it's a small segment, it's a whole bowel, how sick the patient is different between every other patient. So regarding the question, what, what do you do a or B, it, like a binary, as as, um, as Sean said, is very difficult. It's a case by case basis, basically. You need to decide on the spot, on the patient, and regarding what you're looking at. It's, it's, different, it's very difficult to decide A or B, and that's it. And, and Todd, let me ask you that patient you just had, was there, there was a size issue? How, how small? Well, there was a size and an age issue. Um, you know, at what age? I think this baby was 23 weeks and one day. And I think our hospital was 23 weeks. So because it was one day older than that, we decided to survive the baby. And I uh, wanted to place a drain. Um, and the, the neonatology unit wanted me to do an exploratory laparotomy because their, their bias is towards that. Uh, and then the whole discussion came up, why are we doing anything? And, and, and so it was just a debate. I think everyone had a different opinion. The thing is, again, you, you see a patient that you put a drain and the patient cure itself, you know, within seven days and you didn't have to do any laparotomy. And there are patients who have put a drain and get it, get dies in the next six, uh, six hours. So 
But if you decide the patient deserves, if you decide the patient deserves a treatment, uh, just saying a treatment, the baby deserves a treatment based on their size, their weight. Anyway, whatever you do, I mean. Well, is that true? No, no. I'm saying. I don't. I'm not sure. I agree. drain because yeah. I have a huge, you know, distension of the abdomen and, and, and it's difficult to, to have that respiratory, uh, you know. But Miguel, if the baby was 22 weeks, do you feel that the baby should get a treatment? Uh, I need to discuss with the team. With the well, this is the question, team. right? Yeah. And so we're getting lower and lower every year. Sure. So now it's, I don't know, ours, at least in Akron is 23. I don't know what it is in Cincinnati. Yeah. So, um, you know, that's the first debate. If you decide that the baby meets your ethical or whatever criteria, hold on, to do anything, then the second question is, if you think they need treatment, is, is their size and age enough of a reason for you to decide which treatment based on their age and weight? I completely agree with you. That's why I'm saying it's dependent on each patient. It's not about A, B, or C question. It's the, the patient will tell you what to do exactly, right. basically. Mark? question is, is, is a drain a definitive treatment occasionally for, for survival? Yeah, no. So occasionally it is. But I guess the question is over the, for the next 24 hours, is there a survival advantage or disadvantage for drain versus laparotomy? You don't know and, until you do it. Right, no, I, I know. And, and that's the challenge. And that's the thing we don't know. Uh, you know, I think some of us feel that, you know, if the baby's going to die, they'll die with a laparotomy or a drain. If the baby's going to survive, they'll survive just to at least 24, 48 hours with a laparotomy or a drain, maybe. I don't know. I, you know, and I think when I, the way I interpret the Nest trial and everything else that's going on is that, well, for that survival piece, it's not, it's, it's still not 100% clear. Neurodevelopmental outcomes, different story. And, and that's, and, and whether we can argue whether that's clear or not. But I don't know. So a patient like this, Todd, is, to me, is the perfect patient. You put a drain in, and see if they get better and at least you can buy a little bit of time to have more discussions and decide what to do and then go on to a laparotomy yeah. if you need to i yeah. don't think there's but that being said to your point i don't think there's a lower limit to when you can do a laparotomy or not do a laparotomy or any of that on a baby. really yeah. to, to go back to to go back to your comment i kind of got bothered every time a neonatologist told me how to operate my response often is did you go to surgical school you know, I, I didn't go to neonatology school, and so I won't explain to you how to use a ventilator. I would prefer you not explain to me how to, how to do an operation. I mean, you know, that's, this is our business to a certain degree, to make a, a, a who should go to an operating room who not. And, you know, this is a very tricky business. Um, to go back to what Craig said, you're draining an abscess, and sometimes you, you might go to the operating room six hours later after you put the drain in, or 12 hours later, or not at all. The patient's going to let you know. But sometimes it, uh, uh, the drain is just a temporizing measure. Sometimes it's a definitive measure. And you find out by following the patient. Not to open up a can of worms, but who agrees with that statement? That, um, I mean, I, the ultimate decision is ours, but I do believe that working with the neonatology team on the decision to operate is actually um, prudent. I'm sure. I'm sure. I know you were. <laughs> But a lot of people get get upset about that, and and I I do have that discussion now. Ultimately, the decision is mine, um, but oftentimes they do sway me, and they're uh, so I get your point, and that's what happens frequently. So it's not something to just poo poo. That count, yeah. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so just to add, I, I agree with the joint management, and I know you're joking. The other question comes for those who cover outside community hospitals. Does that change your management when you have a drain versus a laparotomy? So if you're, so covering, so if you're covering a community hospitals NICU yeah. and they have free air, mm -hmm. does that change your management versus a drain versus laparotomy? I think if it's a hospital set up for neonatal surgery, it would not. Because the baby could eventually be transferred even after your treatment, whether it was a laparotomy or a drain if it need be. But I think a laparotomy or a drain, yeah, the, it's a bigger operation, but not that much bigger. I mean, it's still relatively, yeah, Mark, you clip and drop. Or put a silo on. <laughs> Go ahead. I was going to say, so, I mean, in my, in my previous institution, this is, again, 10 years ago, I don't know what I do now. 
there were times we'd go out to an outside NICU. It wasn't that far away. We couldn't do a laparotomy there, but you'd have a little baby kind of acting like a, like a sip, you know, again, we don't know. You pop a drain in and see how they do over the years. You'd watch them in the outside hospital, not at the children's hospital, for a couple days to see if they get better. At Rick's point, some of those kids never need a laparotomy, they stay, they don't need a transport. Others, you know, they don't get better, you transport them to a big house and you do an operation. I, I was just going to comment that I think the other thing that we have to think about in these situations is families. And what do families want? And what do parents yeah. want? And, and how, you know, if they have a 22 week or do they really want the kids that have an operation? Um, or what do they want for their child for at, at that age? So I think mean, that's an important part of the consideration when we're making these decisions. Speak. <laughs> Mac, can I call on you? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> We've evolved it case conferences where we're all talking about how we feel and we're not talking about any evidence right now. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it may be better use of our time to move on. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. I, the only final thing I'll say is this is becoming more and more in our face because neonatology is surviving younger and younger and younger, and the separation between surgery and neonatology, is, that chasm is starting to widen because what they can survive is different than what we should be doing, and so that's a new problem for us. Yep, PJ. Okay, last uh, question. 16-month-old, right adrenal mass, measures eight centimeters, biopsy of the mass, favorable histology neuroblastoma, biology, no McN amplification, but has segments of chromosomal, abnormalities. What is the best, best next course? Uh, observe as a low risk, return for complete resection, treat as intermediate risk, or treat as high risk. And so this is a, a recent uh, update paper from the uh, children's oncology folks. You know, that neuroblastoma uh, tree is constantly changing as we're adding, adding new, uh, new info. Have anything from the poll? Digging in. Seconds. I think people are still working on answering. Yes, yeah, sounds good. Comment before the poll. All right, I'll just wait a second, then in silence. <laughs> <laughs> well, so like people are saying C, treat as an intermediate risk tumor. It's like 62 percent. This is good. So, this would actually be a, a high risk tumor based on the 2020 uh, 21 COG uh, data on the review from the most recent set. Um, looking at specifically those chromosomal uh, aberrations, loss of game portions, you know, we're really getting very uh, sensitive and, and our colleagues doing this research. Um, again, this is uh, uh, that arm that, that highlights that change in the uh, schemata, making it uh, high risk as we're looking for the non-amplification. And now that next, next arm or next branch of the tree where we're looking at those uh, segmental chromosomal uh, abnormalities um, and and it's great you know I mean we've evolved and we're getting a lot more data a lot more rapidly on, on some of the what the genetics are and what the tumor biology is and and how these kids will uh, will respond and how they should be treated that's it for for us all right oh my gosh we are this is a first. We're so ahead of schedule. It's because you guys don't have mics in your hands, and so everyone's quieter. We'll try to do a better job getting everyone a microphone. Um, all right. We are scheduled now for a 20-minute break. 20-minute break, Ellen tells me, as you guys can see. I completely rely on Ellen here. Um, we're going to take a 20-minute break. We're 10 minutes ahead of schedule, so we're, gonna not, we're not going to stay on schedule. We're going to move ahead. So 20 minute break and we'll start the next session 10 minutes earlier than it's listed on the agenda. Does that sound about right, Ellen? Did I say that? What? We'll be five minutes early, okay. I see a 10 here, sorry. Okay, got it. So let's take a break and we'll see you guys soon, thanks. <laughs>